Welcome to Halting Towards Zion, the podcast where we limp like Jacob to the promised land and talk about life, the universe, and everything along the way. I'm Emily Maxson, here with Greg Uttinger, and we have been in Babylon with Daniel, and now we're coming back from Babylon. We're going to talk today about the Restoration Covenant. Before we start off, I guess it is a starting off. It's not really before we're starting off. I'm going to begin with asking you, Greg, to Mm -hmm. uh, articulate the distinction between this covenant and what came before. Why why should we consider this a distinct administration of the covenant of grace? Mm -hmm. What's new about it? Okay. Well, first of all, I do want to point out that not everybody notices this particular version. Probably some who do would say, nah, that's that's not a distinct thing. Here are my reasons for thinking it is, and other people can consider them and see if it makes sense. The last covenant was the Davidic covenant. Now, in a sense, all of the covenants keep on going, Mm -hmm. because we will find references. We find references at Malachi, remember the law of Moses. We get to the New Testament, and we're told we're the children of Abraham. Uh, Peter's, but doesn't that have to be because it's one covenant? Because it's one covenant, and yeah. that's covenantal <laughs> theology speaking, that it's not broken up dispensations where each one closes and God tries something relatively brand new. At least that was classic dispensationalism. But there is one covenant. It's in Christ. There's one God. He has one essential standard of morality. There's one gospel. And, and so as God reveals himself more and more under historical circumstances— at times, he radically changes the, st- the outward structure. Not the promise, not who he is, not how we're saved, not the gospel, not the Savior and the mediator, but outward forms. For instance, in the Garden of Eden, after the fall, Adam and Eve were given sacrifice. That was a new thing, and it um, continued on until Jesus died. So that's an ongoing thing. They knew about cleanness and uncleanness because Noah did, but we're not told what exactly Mm -hmm. they did with it, but it was was a thing that doesn't continue past uh, Christ's coming. So there there wasn't a whole lot going on there. We get to Noah, we get the rainbow in the sky, and we get the death penalty, the status to enforce. But most of the rest of it is a re-emphasis on what God had said way back at the beginning, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth. Oh, the animals will be afraid of you now. You're still in charge of them, but they're they're not going to like you much. And then we go and we run into, after 10 generations, we run into Abraham, and now something really new is happening. God sets apart a particular part of land that he claims is his for special purposes, and he calls Abraham to that land, and he gives him the sign and seal of circumcision. Now, Abraham's still sacrificing, presumably still knows about cleanness laws, but doesn't seem to, they don't seem to affect anything. There may be some slight side allusions to them. But um, the land is new. The the, the specification of a particular people, his seed Mm -hmm. is new. But some of the older things very clearly continue. Marriage, he's still married. That goes back to before (laughs) uh, before, um, the fall. So we, we're seeing continuity, but we're seeing some outward changes. Then comes the Exodus, and we get the biggest change probably until Jesus comes. We have um, Levitical priests, we have a tabernacle, we have all kinds of clean and uncleanness laws, we have festival feast days that uh, are scattered across the calendar and across 50 years in terms of the Jubilee. Uh, you have to, go, if you want to sacrifice, you have to sacrifice in a particular place. Originally, mm-hmm. that was at the tabernacle. You can't sacrifice just anywhere. But circumcision continues in that narrow line, and it's still with those people. Oh, and they have a civil constitution of sorts. They have judges who administer civil laws, and that's all part of this. And yet nothing that's essential, nothing, it's same God, same Christ, same gospel. This is where dispensationalism missed. They, they understood that there were some changes, but they failed to understand God does not change the gospel. So it's the same thing. And then in terms of the Mosaic Covenant, well, things go bad in the book of Judges, and then in 1 Samuel, (laughs) they they lose the ark, the priests are corrupt. When they get the ark back, it never goes back in the tabernacle, so that system falls apart. Their first king fails, and so God intervenes and gives them David. And the promise there is that his son will build the house of the Lord, and that's true on two levels, Solomon and later Jesus, in different ways. Um, but David is supposed to be king of Israel and his seat after him. 
Yet when we get to the Babylonian captivity, something has gone wrong because David's seed aren't on the throne. There is no throne. Um, and for a while, there's no temple. And during the Restoration, all of that has shut down. So something really major has happened. And you can say, well, they put it all back together. Yeah, not exactly. A lot of it goes back together, but there's never, until Jesus comes, there will not be a king on the throne of David. And when he comes, it won't be the same sort of king on the same sort of throne. So that actually has gone into a a a what's the word? Abasance? 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 Yeah, that. It doesn't, it doesn't <laughs> exist anymore. In, in, that, in that form. Um, so when we come here and, and we see what is in effect a second exodus, mm -hmm. arguably a third, Abraham was brought out of, or of the Chal Chaldees, notice Chaldees, Chaldean mm -hmm. empire, that's where they're coming yeah. out of. <laughs> in between was that thing in Egypt. So this is technically the third exodus. Which is and also the first. Yeah. It's because it's going back further. Yeah, it's going, they, they're sent all mm -hmm. the way back to where Abraham was, not simply back to Egypt, but all the way back to Mesopotamia, to Babylon. So it's as if God just hit reset. We should expect now something kind of major. And that's what we're going to talk about, uh, rather than anticipate everything. Um, mm -hmm. What's going to change is political. Uh, we'll see the political changes, the geographical changes, the changes that are very visible to any outsider who can just look and say, that's not the way it used to be. But we'll also look at the heavenly changes, how worship is going to change. There are things that are not the same. And it, it's a certain amount of ignorance or, or blaséness that says, well, it, you know, temple's a temple, worship is a temple, worship is a temple, worship. No, it's not. Mm. When certain things are missing from it, <laughs> Things of key importance in the old and in the Mosaic Covenant, and yet they're glibly ignored now. And God obviously knows what He's doing. Um, so, and, and, and but the thing perhaps that throws people off the most, and we'll, we'll come to this, is well, it doesn't say there's a covenant. Yeah, it does actually. First mm -hmm. of all, Ezekiel and Jeremiah both point to a new covenant, and you can read Calvin on this. Calvin kind of puts it at the restoration, and then sees the new the covenant with Jesus as the super fulfillment and the, the fullness of that. But ignoring the prophets, in the book of Nehemiah, there's a covenant, mm -hmm. but, but the people make it themselves. Ah, wow, that's really different, isn't it? That's enough to justify <laughs> yeah. calling it a brand new covenant, because the people understand what's happened. And instead of being little children who are led by the hand, God expects them to figure it out and write the document and sign it themselves under the mm -hmm. authority of the people he's inspired and put over them. So there are some other things we could say. I mentioned a couple of them to you before we started, but I don't think I'll go there right now. I, I, I think that's what we're looking for. Is the change here so significant that heaven and earth are altered by what happens? And is there, in fact, a new covenant document? Well, the answer to all those is yes. Mm -hmm. So that's my initial plea. There are some other things I could say, uh, but I think that's either going to get people thinking or... If it doesn't, then probably anything else I would mm -hmm. say would not matter a whole lot. But it's something I think to think a about. Slight, a slight counter argument, maybe. Um, mm -hmm. You can tell me what you think about this, in that the stipulations and sanctions don't seem to be altered. Um, the form of temple worship maybe is in there, and that's altered, but it seems to be a re emphasis on what they have from Moses. Well, there is a renewed emphasis upon what they had from Moses, but because of their political situation, most of the sanctions they can't enforce. Wait till we get to the Roman Empire. They can't enforce the death penalty. They mm -hmm. can't stone anyone mm -hmm. unless they actually They don't violate. have the civil authority. They don't have the civil authority. Yeah. So the sanctions are different. They could stone, mm -hmm. the, Rome allowed them to stone someone who actually defiled the temple out in plain sight, which is how they got away with stoning Stephen. Mm -hmm. But when it came to Jesus, they didn't have anything they could make stick. They could not enforce sanctions against him. They're under a jurisdiction where they have um, a parental imperial unit looking after them mm -hmm. that severely restricts what they can and cannot do. And so is the basic morality the same? Yeah, that was that's one thing I keep saying. The morality doesn't change. Mm -hmm. How you're going to implement it does. And the final consequence of you turn your back on God and he'll excommunicate you possibly permanently, that was way back in the Mosaic Law, and now we see it played out. We get to the point where God does indeed enforce those sanctions, 
but that time it seems once and for all. We could talk about some hints in in Romans and elsewhere that maybe God still has something for Israel, but there's no hint that it's as a nation. It would mm-hmm. be as a people. So yeah, sin is still sin and God still frowns on it, and he hasn't altered this almost sounds like theonomy. He has he hasn't altered the penalties any. Well, yeah, he kind of has. Uh, or <laughs> at least that authority from Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because now the church is moving out into a multicultural world where mm-hmm. they're not in charge. This is new. How do you mm-hmm. keep how do you maintain the law of God in a pagan land? So that's a brand new lesson they had to learn. Um so I don't know that that's a counter argument. I think it's just a further mm-hmm. uh, explanation of what's going on here and and setting us up for what actually is going on here. God's so getting, out of curiosity, mm-hmm. do theonomists consider the Restoration Covenant one of a, a new administration of the government? Oh, it depends on who you call a theonomist, I suppose. Um, I don't know that there's complete um, agreement in that camp over that, but I, some do, and some mm-hmm. wrote before anybody mentioned it, so I don't know. Mm-hmm. So am I a theonomist? Not by any recognizable standard, probably. Uh, but do you mean I do I respect the law of God and think that there is wisdom and application in it? Yep, Jesus did. So, you know, we'll go with that. But that's that doesn't <laughs> mean it's cut and paste and that we automatically lift everything from Exodus and put it into American civil code. That's not understanding. <laughs> that's not understanding what God's doing. And and again, the restoration covenant can help us see that mm-hmm. as we as we look and see. God spread his people very deliberately among the Gentiles so that they there would be a synagogue in every city when the apostles started spreading across the empire. In the meantime, they have to live in a pagan society where they have to deal with pagan civil governments, kind of like we do today. So God is getting the church ready for thinking about what it lives means to live the gospel in a multicultural world. Well, we've gotten to That's the conclusion. Cool. <laughs> we got to the conclusion without really going through all the material, but maybe that people will find that more interesting than merely reciting the facts of the Restoration. Uh, if you don't like Restoration Covenant, call it the Restoration Era and see if what we have to say isn't um, profitable. Uh, Emily's already pointed out that as a restoration, it is a, it's a new exodus. It's a return from exile. And uh, something that we talked about before we started is that th- these the books involved here in Scripture are very unfamiliar by and large. Most people, most Christians probably can't tell you very much of what's in Ezra. Um, they may know that Nehemiah has something to do with rebuilding the walls. That's usually mm-hmm. the, the, the little Nehemiah. thing you put down. Nehemiah. Yeah. Ne- yeah. You have a mental <laughs> the, image of a man who's so tall that the walls come to his knees. There you go. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's what uh, I was shown in, in Sunday school as a child, oh, so I, I'll never forget I, it. I, I have heard that, but never so graphically before. <laughs> Didn't know you drew pictures. Um, we're a little more familiar with the story of Esther, but what part it plays in all this seems vague. I think most Christians get the idea that this is an attempt to exterminate the Messianic line, and it failed. And that's certainly true, and that's really important. That's kind of the heart of things. But it does come at a particular time, at a particular place, under certain historical circumstances. And to see how it fits in is important. And then there are the three minor prophets, uh, Haggai, Zechariah, and Malachi, um, who, again, are we, we know bits and pieces. Haggai, not so much. Zechariah is one of those weird books like the Apocalypse where we say, what the world is going on here? <laughs> what do you mean there's a roll flying through the air? I don't get this. Why is, why is there a woman in this thing and why are people with wings carrying her? You know, it's like, I don't, I don't know this. Malachi, yeah, we probably know the line that God hates divorce, and we may know there's something about robbing God. And John the Baptist. And and yes, and predictions of John the Baptist. Mm-hmm. Because there. we see the footnote when we read the New Testament. <laughs> yes, this indeed. Is from Malachi. <laughs> um, so what what we what I would like to do now is just kind of talk through the history as history. The Restoration Era then begins with a man named Cyrus. Cyrus was king of Media and Persia. Uh, If you want to read what may be a fictional account of his childhood and how he came to power, you know, based on a true story, one of those things, (laughs) uh, you can read Herodotus in his histories. Um, I was thinking at the end about recommending Herodotus 
uh, as, as a book to read if you like history, but I, I think I'll pick something else. But Herodotus, by and large, is fairly easy reading in a good translation. And he starts with the conflict between what for him is East and West, the Greek city-states being the West and Persia being the East, which is a wholly Greek-oriented, Greek-dominated <laughs> position on how history and geography worked. Mm -hmm. And he takes it back to the Trojan War and says it all started when people, when both sides started stealing women back and forth. And, and then people just got crazy over it because who kills, cares whether or not you, know, you steal a woman here or there? They should, if they get stolen, it's their fault. They should just learn to deal. Um, yes, Herodotus is a male chauvinist pig and is uh, <laughs> quite humorous to read. But he does tell the story of how Cyrus was nearly killed by his grandfather, how he was delivered. It's, it's a, the very familiar story of kill the baby. I'm not going to kill the baby. I'm going to pass the baby to somebody else and he'll kill it or not. Oh, he didn't kill it. Rats, the baby grew up. Oh, <laughs> the, the grandfather found out about that. Now he's killing my son. Wonderful. That's great. Well, I now must revenge myself. So I'll go to, and, and in somewhere in there, Cyrus is raised by a woman whose name means wolf. So Cyrus, like uh, everybody else in the world, is raised by wolves. <laughs> <It's reasonable. laughs> um, but he eventually, Cyrus eventually is informed of his background and resents being almost killed. And he raises up the Persian half of his family. He's descended from both the Medes and the Persians. So he gets the Persians to go to follow him into battle. And the Medes kind of not liking their ruler anyway, kind of join and it just, and he takes, kind of, kind of takes over. And then he takes over Asia Minor. Um, and during this, Babylon's declining. And so we saw in the, the last thing we looked at in Daniel, Daniel 6, we see um, Cyrus, although Daniel calls him Darius, which was a throne name or a nickname. Um, we see him take the city and make Daniel his chief guy, his right-hand man. And it's probably about that time that Daniel digs out a scroll of Isaiah. We know he had well, at least some of the scrolls. He had Jeremiah's for sure. And he probably took it to Cyrus and he probably read this because someone did. This is what Isaiah says hundreds of years ahead of time. Speaking of himself, the Lord says, Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, and he that formed thee from the womb. I am the Lord that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone, that spreadeth abroad the earth by myself, that frustrateth the tokens of the liars, and maketh diviners mad, and turneth wise men backward, maketh their knowledge foolish, that confirmeth the word of his servant, and performeth the counsel of his messengers, that saith to Jerusalem, Thou shalt be inhabited, and to the cities of Judah you shall be built, and I will raise up the decayed places thereof. Pause. None of this hadn't, Jerusalem was still standing. So he's telling, God is through Isaiah is telling the people, your city's going to be leveled, all the cities of Judah are going to be leveled. But one day I will give an order to have it all rebuilt. Now, at this point, everyone's listening. Well, how's that going to happen? Who's going to do that? What's the, what's the, the deal here? Um, that saith to the deep, be dry, and I will dry up the rivers. That saith of Cyrus, he is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure, even saying to Jerusalem, thou shalt be built, and to the temple, thy foundation shall be laid. Notice the foundation, not the rest. The rest comes in time. Thus saith mm -hmm. the Lord to his anointed, that's Messiah. <laughs> to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have holden to subdue nations before him. I will loose the loins of kings. Think of uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's, or, sorry, Belshazzar's knees knocking together because his loins <laughs> were loosed. Uh, to open before him the two leave gates, and the gates shall not be shut. I will go before thee and make the crooked places straight. I will break in pieces the gates of brass and cut and sunder the bars of iron. And I will give thee the treasures of darkness and the hidden riches of secret places, that thou mayest know that I, the Lord, that call thee by name, am the God of Israel. For Jacob my servant's sake, and for Israel's mine elect, I have even called thee by name. I have surnamed thee, though thou hast not known me. And he goes on and talks to him and about him just a little bit more, but that's, that's the heart of it. Uh, through Isaiah, God names the man who will order the temple's foundation uh, laid, who will order Jerusalem rebuilt, who will conquer a good part of the world, and he calls him his shepherd, his anointed, and his servant. How needlessly messianic can we get here? <laughs> um, this is obviously is a huge deal. 
Now, when we get to Ezra, it's also in the, the last chapter of Second Chronicles, the two passages are almost identical. Uh, we hear Cyrus's own words. Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he hath charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judah. How did he know that if he hadn't read <laughs> Isaiah? I mean, those, those are basically Isaiah's words. Who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him, and let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God, which is in Jerusalem, and people who don't go help with money. So Cyrus becomes a key figure of Christ. He's the shepherd. He's the anointed. He's the one who authorizes this exodus out of Babylon, back to the promised land. He orders and funds, to some extent, the temple being rebuilt and restocked, and Jews Jerusalem rebuilt. He is a pagan figure of Christ, but he's not a pagan, because he not acknowledges <laughs> Yahweh Elohim to be the God. And if we go back and read the lion's den story, now that all makes sense. He was, Darius Cyrus was truly converted. He was impressed and he sent word throughout the whole empire, no one delivers like this God, guys. Get a clue. That's the man we're dealing with here. And so this, this is a huge thing in, in redemptive history. God has scattered his people throughout the world and now he's bringing them back. But here's the thing. Not everybody goes back. In fact, the vast majority, it seems, don't. And that can look like a big failure. The, the interesting thing about this Restoration Era is it's not what you would expect in the flesh. If you're spiritual, yeah, you'll expect that, but you know. We would expect, well, you know, um, in the past, to, to change covered administrations, God drowned a world. He destroyed an empire. Okay, he raised up a king out of, out of after defeating a giant. That's not so big a deal, but you know, isn't there were some fireworks? Yeah, there were there were yeah. there were sometimes some very huge flooding of the Red Sea. Yeah, sort of, frogs yeah. and lice and all that stuff. Hail, hail and fire from heaven, and in the wake of that, when they enter the Promised Land, the sun standing still, and even the Davidic economy as it's falling apart. We have Elisha and Elijah ministering in the north, doing mm -hmm. some profound miracles. And you get here and you think, wow, so the, God's really starting over, so everything's going to be super miraculous. No, the, uh, the Isaiah spoke of drying up rivers before Cyrus. That's a figure of speech. There were no rivers dried up. He didn't part the Euphrates. The children of Israel used normal, standard means of transportation to get back home. Um, secular history can look at this and have no problem with it because there's no element of the miraculous anywhere except the divine kind of prediction in advance. Mundane details, like how is this going to be funded? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, how is this going to be funded? Oh, the king of Persia did it. Huh, that's interesting. Hmm. But he didn't do all the funding. A lot had to come from the offerings of God's people scattered about the empire. And then there were legal battles and permits <laughs> that had to be got. Exactly. Yeah. Excellent. Grouchy neighbors. <laughs> yeah. Really mundane things. <laughs> Very mundane, ordinary kinds of things. And there are no angels drawing their swords. There, the sun does not move backward. There are no frogs being belched out by the rivers. <laughs> it is, as you say, mundane. I like your remark about permits, because that's basically one of the big things they struggle with. Do we have government permission to go on with this? And can we prove it? And for a while, it stands in doubt. Maybe we can't. They're going, we won't be able to do this. Maybe we're, we're, we're halted by the same county building codes as everybody else. <laughs> but this is the Bible. These things aren't supposed to happen. Isn't there supposed to be a miracle here? And there's not. And the two men who lead the return, they're named in, um, in the uh, second chapter of Ezra, are Zerubbabel, who is a descendant of the line of kings. You know, a very ordinary sort of name. <laughs> yeah. And um, Joshua. Joshua. Jesus. A not so ordinary sort of name. Mm -hmm. He's high priest, and they both seem to be older men because by the time they have done their thing, they pass quickly from the scene. So mm -hmm. they're 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 probably at least very mature. They're not they're not really young men. And their first task first task is getting the altar up and starting sacrificial worship again. They do that, 
And then they, they work on laying the, the foundation slab or clearing the foundation slab or refurbishing or whatever exactly they did for a new temple. And then neighbors show up who want to say they want to help, but really don't, who then ask to see their permits and send word to the emperor. And by now, Cyrus is dead. And his son is dead. And an imposter is dead. There's a new guy on the throne named Darius. It's different Darius or different Darius, who doesn't even know about these people. And so when he gets word of, these people are building this city and that's going to be troublemakers, he says, okay, well, stop them until you hear from me. Because apparently he knows enough, he's learned enough about, you know, the laws of the Medes and Persians that don't change <laughs> to in deliberately insert a loophole for later. So he doesn't know, but it sounds bad, but he'll look at it later. He's got things to do, like stabilize the empire. Um, and, and so that's how this is beginning. But we need to look at that new temple when it's finally finished. Because Darius does eventually not only say, yeah, your temple, you can build the temple. We were talking about the city. Temple's not a problem. In fact, you know what? We're funding the temple. Uh, I've heard about this God of yours. He's, he's simply called the God of heaven. I want you sacrificing and praying for me and my sons. So do that. And all of you bad guys who were trying to interfere, give them your money so they can do it. Hey. <laughs> um, so the temple does get built. But first thing, when the temple slab is laid or refurbished, the old people cry. Now, we've all had the experience, I think, of looking at a foundation slab and saying, that is so tiny. What we envisioned could not possibly be exhausted by that slab. It shouldn't it be two or three times as big. Um, I know um, where we used to live, right around the corner, there was this triangular lot that looked so small. And when they started clearing it and they started putting in foundations, what's going to go there? What can even fit there? Well, by the time they were done, they had like two strip malls and <laughs> lots of parking lot room. And I still am not quite sure how it all fit, but I do know that foundation slabs are deceptive. So... The older people see that, and they remember Solomon's temple, and they weep. They're very upset. They're disappointed. The young people, they have no experience. They say, wow, God's really on the move. We got a temple slab going here. And so they're very excited. So they shout for joy. And far away, it says you could hear a lot of noise, but you couldn't tell the shouts of joy from the weeping. They were both so loud. Well, why? what was so disappointing? Here are some things that were disappointing. And this is, again, this is back to why I would argue that the change in worship is enough to signal us that we should expect a new covenant at this point. The most obvious thing that this new temple did not have was the Ark of the Covenant. How do you do Day of Atonement ceremonies without the Ark of the Covenant? Answer, we don't know. God did not explain what they were to do. There's no record that they ceased as such, but what did the priest do when he went behind the veil? Where did he put the blood? There's no Ark. And that means, by the way, there's no Ten Commandments. Mm -hmm. um, there's no Shekinah glory, not a visible one. So all of that, which was in effect the big deal about the tabernacle and then about Solomon's temple, just isn't there anymore. So that's a huge thing. And yet it seems the festivals went on and the sacrifices and the altar went on, just as if God were present, because as God speaks to Zechariah, he makes it clear he is present. In fact, he's mm -hmm. present not only in the new temple, the whole city, by the time Nehemiah is done building and sanctifying the walls, is now the holy city. God's people are becoming the glory cloud. This is a major change. Mm -hmm. And somehow it still justifies a day of atonement, even though it can't be done the same way. Worship has changed. Also, um, the priest no longer has the Urim and Thummim, so direct contact with God has been shut down. So again, a secularist walking in, a time traveler secularist from the 21st century walks in and says, where's the miracles? Uh, there's, there's a peek behind the curtain. It's an empty room with a lot of blood on the floor, apparently. Um, that thing that she used to talk about, yeah, we lost that. Uh-huh, right. Well, how about the fire in the altar? I suppose God lit that from heaven? No, he used a Bic lighter. Because um, <laughs> God had lit the fire before, mm -hmm. you know, both for the tabernacle and the temple. He didn't light this fire. They brought you know, sticks together or something, or used a flint box or a magnifying glass in the sun. However they did it, they just lit it. Interesting Are, that they had the confidence to do so, given what yes, happened. Yes, it is. Yeah. Because um, Nadab and Abihu tried something like that and got themselves killed mm -hmm. for offering strange fire before the Lord. 
there is no indication here that they had that kind of permission. Now, you look at Zechariah's visions and the issue of how does the priest start the cleansing rituals when he himself is defiled? Mm -hmm. And the answer is, well, you get a priest who isn't, and then he, wait, but we don't have one. We need the priest cleansed so he can do the cleansing rituals on himself. That doesn't... And it requires a prophet to step in and says, Jesus has done it in the background, go for it. And from there, apparently extrapolated that, oh, it's all right. God has told us to do this. God, is by his prophet, has authorized temple worship. So I guess we do what we do. Uh, there's no fun. We're not seeing any lightning storms. So someone step up there and light that thing. <laughs> Must have been an interesting moment. Mm -hmm. But it does shed light on this whole administration. God is withdrawing the miraculous, the theophanies. There are only three prophets and they that we know of, and th there's there's some are mentioned in Nehemiah, but they seem to all have been false prophets. <laughs> and yeah, I mean you could and you could you could call Nehemiah and Ezra and perhaps Mordecai prophets because they wrote word, the words of God. But in terms of a regular office of prophet, someone who was known publicly as the prophet who kept having visions, revelations, it's it's those three guys, and then we're done. And for 400 years, God is silent. Um, so God is throwing his people back on two things, the regularities of his providence and the regularity of covenant life. In other words, what you said earlier, get out of bed, have breakfast, go downtown, get the permit, come back, pick up a hammer, start the work. Do not expect God to miraculously hand you a temple or anything else. Um, you Gentile neighbors, Tell them about the God of Israel. Tell them about the Messiah. Yeah, they may persecute you, but they may come to faith. You won't know until you find out, until you try. Hammer so, in one hand, sword in the other. Yeah. Yeah, they might, but they may come for us. Well, pick Be up a ready. sword. <laughs> yeah. don't, don't expect God's angels to swoop in and defend you. It's not going to happen. And, and, and it would be easy to say, it's all secularized now. The miraculous is gone. The genie's put back in the bottle. No, God was never a genie. God held the hand of his people and walked them to kindergarten for nearly 3,500 years or so. And now they're at the point where, you know what? You don't need all this stuff. You don't need the Shekinah You don't need glory. the yes, no answers because you have the whole Old the, the Testament. Whole, yeah. They finish off the whole Old Testament. You don't need it, that anymore. You, you, you don't need to, you know, a lifeline. Can I phone a friend? No. Can I phone God? No. How about a prophet? No. You don't need any of that anymore. The Bible is in place for that time. Now, there's still more to come when Jesus comes. But until then, you have a Bible that is adequate for your daily needs right now. You have these worshiping congregations scattered throughout the empire where people meet, and without benefit of profit or sacrifice, they read from the Old Testament, they read from the Law of Prophets, they say prayers to God, they chant psalms, Maybe, maybe with or without musical instruments, depending on who you believe. Um, and they tell their Gentile neighbors about the God of Israel, and they win people to become God-fearers. And beyond that, they go to work and earn money and take care of their families and raise children to believe the promises. In other words, it sounds an awful lot like us. Hmm. God mm -hmm. is getting his people ready to be us. And he starts before Jesus comes. Um, and so when the apostles go out in the empire, these these synagogues and these Jewish communities are there. Not, not, not everybody received the gospel. Many rejected it. But many received it, and the, and the synagogues were always the first place the apostles went. And that's what's being established now. God is setting this up with Sixth Covenant administration, because this is the one where Jesus is going to come. This is where the true Son of Man will appear. And the beasts who have ruled the empire as Daniel sees it, will give way to the Son of Man, who will have all power and dominion. And yes, I'm hinting at the creation week. <laughs> um, and, and so that's what we're seeing here. Now, on the political side, and then this is also important, a lot of the things we talked about up front, uh, Israel is not an independent nation. Not, not initially. Uh, she's ruled by Babel, uh, by, well, by Babylon, she's destroyed. She ruled temporarily by Babylon, then destroyed. Then ruled by Medo-Persia. Um, and then by Greece, and um, for a little time gains independence from the Greek tyrants, but then Rome comes along and conquers her, and then that's that, and she will end her days as a province of the Roman Empire. 
She does not have a Davidic king on the throne. In fact, the Davidic line is cursed. Mm -hmm. um, back when um, Jeremiah was writing, there was a young man on the throne, one of the last kings, the son of um, Josiah, whose name was variously Jeconiah or Jehoiachin or Coniah. And as a young man in his teens, he was so wicked that God said, we're done. I'm done with the line of David. The prophecy from Jeremiah, O earth, 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 hear the word of the Lord. Write ye this man childless. No son of his shall ever prosper, sitting upon the throne of David and ruling anymore in Israel. And that was that. The, David, the Davidic line, as far as anyone can see, ended, and the Davidic covenant apparently ended right there. Now, God is incredibly sneaky. <laughs> No, because the Messiah has to be a true son of David according to the flesh, and yet the kingly line just got excommunicated. How could you possibly put that back together again? Well, what if his mother's the true seed of David and his father, his adoptive father, is in the kingly line? Then he would have a legal but not biological claim to the throne. But being a true son of David through his mother, he would also have that claim... And that happened exactly once, and that's why the genealogies for Jesus are so terribly important. Because mm -hmm. they show us how the Davidic covenant can be put back into operation. But as Israel look at this, they, they could by faith hope that God had a solution, but it wasn't obvious. There's no Davidic king. We are the subjects, uh, we're a small province in a small corner of a pagan empire. In the days of Rome, they weren't even directly accountable to Rome. They were for a while accountable Remember when Cyrenius was governor of Syria? That's because it was <laughs> yeah. part of the Syrian section of the Roman Empire. They didn't even have direct line to Rome. They, they were under somebody who was under somebody. And as we said, that made, that made a difference as to how you could and could not enforce biblical law. There are a lot of things that the pagans just would say, no, we're not doing that. Again, Rome specifically said, yeah, we don't trust you with the death penalty. Uh, you can't execute people. You have someone you think needs executing, you bring them to us, and we will try them in our courts. Israel was effectively deprived of a law court, at least for more serious effect, offenses. Uh, and the Israelites scattered throughout the world didn't have even that much. They were generally non-citizens of the communities they lived in because those pagan communities determined citizenship by worshiping the local god, and of course the Jews didn't. So they were strangers in strange lands, making a living and worshiping God as best they could with what they had. And for most of them, it was not temple worship. Um, they would try to make the, the trek back to Jerusalem for Passover or Pentecost. But just reading the book of Acts, it's clear they didn't always make it. So things are very, very different. You can't, this is not just more of the same except it's wearing thin. No, it's broken. Mm -hmm. and, and God is putting something new in its place. Now, as we come to... Um, the books in question, we have Ezra. Ezra wants to be a teacher of law. He's living in Babylon, and he wants to go back and lead a great revival. This is after Zerubbabel and Joshua have died. And he, and he gets permission from the king of Persia to do so, but he shows up already to teach the word of God, and he finds that Israel terribly compromised. All the leaders are, are marrying pagan women. The whole system is about to fall apart again. And Ezra ends with him uh, conducting an annulment or divorce ceremony. It goes on for a couple chapters. Like, well, that was terribly underwhelming. What's that all about? <laughs> what fits in somewhere just before Ezra is the whole story of Esther, and I won't repeat all of that, but I think most people know that in Ezra is, I mean, uh, Esther is um, abducted, because it's hard to put it any lighter than that, mm -hmm. into the king's harem and is up for trial to be queen or not. And all of those women were put in the king's harem because the Persians too had great contempt for women. I mean, they took care of them, but you come in, you visit the king. If he doesn't like you, then you're put in the other group of concubines and you never know a man for the rest of your life. You're protected. You're given any material thing you can want, best food, best clothes and all that, but you're never going to be married because you're married to the king. And that's that. But Esther receives favor. She's promoted to be queen and is there at a crucial time to turn back a genocidal plot against the Jews that comes close to destroying the Messianic line, had it succeeded. Mm -hmm. But she and her cousin Mordecai are there at a key event. 
After that, we come to Nehemiah, which is the last of the history books that belong to this period. And Nehemiah, living, living after that conflict, because the Jews' enemies still did try to attack them. They just, the Jews had imperial support, so it didn't go the way that the enemies hoped. But Jerusalem sustained attacks, and Nehemiah hears, oh, the walls are broken down, the gates are burned. This was new knowledge, because why would he worry about something that happened 70 years ago? Whatever had been put back in place had been knocked down again, and Nehemiah is very sad and deliberately develops a plan to get imperial aid. He, after praying for a couple months with friends, he goes in and deliberately acts sad in the presence of the king, which you're not supposed to do, but being in, because being in the presence of the king is a joyful thing, and to be sad could get you killed. But he counts that he's been faithful enough that the king may listen to him. And the note says, so the king said, the queen sitting beside him, what queen do you think? Who's the only queen we care about? <laughs> Esther's there, dear. You should listen to this guy. <laughs> And so he's authorized to come back and rebuild the walls. And the thing that's marvelous at the end is there is this ceremony where they sanctify the walls. The walls had never been sanctified. But now Jerusalem becomes the holy city very explicitly. And there are a couple places where they're standing on the walls, and yet it said they're standing in the temple. Well, those are not the same thing, unless this administration has transformed things so that these are identical concepts. The whole city and the whole people are now holy, covenantally speaking. And it's at that point that Nehemiah and Ezra, Ezra finally gets to do his preaching sermon and lead a great revival. And at the end of that, Ezra, Nehemiah, and all of the leaders say, we need to write a covenant document that recognizes what just happened. And they do. Um, it starts in chapter 9, and I'm not going to read it because a lot of it is just one really long prayer to God recounting their covenant history and how God has always been gracious, and they've always been wicked. And it comes to, toward the end of their prayer, they say this, Now therefore our God, the great, the mighty, the terrible God, who keep us covenant and mercy, let not all the troubles seem little before thee that hath come upon us, on our kings, upon our princes, upon our priests, upon our prophets, and our fathers, and all thy people, since the time of the kings of Assyria unto this day. How be it thou art just in all that thou hast brought upon us, for... Thou hast done right, but we've done wickedly. Neither have our kings, our princes, our priests, nor our fathers kept thy law, nor hearkened unto the commandments, and thy testimonies were without its testify against them. So we're, we're drawing roots back to the Davidic covenant, the time of the kings of Assyria. We're going back to Sinai, because God keeps covenant. For they have not served thee in their kingdom, and in thy great goodness which thou gavest them, and the large and fat land which thou gavest before them. Now we're back in Joshua. Neither turn they from their wicked works. Behold, we are thy servants this day, and for the land that thou gavest unto our fathers to eat the fruit of, and the good thereof, behold, we are servants in it, and it yieldeth much increase unto the kings whom thou hast set over us because of our sins. We're under the jurisdiction of the Persians, and a lot of the, the blessings you give us go right, uh, they go right to the Persian capital, Shushan. Shushan, yeah. yeah. And um, they have dominion over our bodies and our cattle, it's their pleasure, and we're in great distress. And because of this, because of all of this, we make a sure covenant and write it, and our princes, Levites, and priests seal unto it. Now, does that sound like they're operating in the flesh and that they're making up something God did not approve of? The whole argument is, we've rebelled against you. You've kept covenant. We haven't. You've been gracious to us. You've given us a new start but we're still under your discipline. This is not the way it's supposed to be. And therefore, we feel it incumbent upon us. We feel obligated by scriptural truth to write the covenant and to sign it and to seal it. Chapter 10. Now, those who sealed were Nehemiah. And we go through a list of many of the leaders of the Levites and priests we've already seen. And interestingly enough, there are a couple things they add that aren't in God's law mostly having to do with maintenance of the, of the temple, because times have changed and it's got to be paid for, and the things they used to do aren't enough anymore. They don't have the same economy. They don't have the same economy. They don't have the same tax collection. They can't, they, 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 need, they need to pay for these things. Mm -hmm. And so they add, I forget what it is, something like part of a shekel or something annually. Um, but they reinforce the Sabbath, and I believe the seventh year Sabbath, they still managed to pull that one off, and their first fruits and their tithes. So again, we're going back. We're going back to the law of Moses, and we're 
stylizing it for this. We're doing the best we can with these historical circumstances, and they 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 have no sense that well we're we're playing cheap with God. God really wanted this, but we can only do this, so it's good enough, no doubt. No, they believe this is exactly what God wants them to do, and they are very conscious of their sins and their failures and the failures of the past. They do not see this as a failure. They see this as, this is what God has set us up for. This is what he expects us. We are under the rod. We have to kiss the rod. Rebelling against us and saying, no, we're going to do it God's way and we'll tear everything else down until we can, is not the solution. This is an era where God's people learned to submit to Gentile authority, to pagan authority, and yet not surrender their gospel or their morality, but to live out the faith as best they can, both at home and in their churches or synagogues, and in the civil realm as best they can, little by little. And this is the administration that's in place when Jesus comes and it explains so much of how he interacts with the Roman Empire and the Jewish authorities. Mm -hmm. But that's still 400 years off, but the clock's ticking now, and they know the time's short. Better than 4,000 years. Yeah, 400, a little bit better than 4,000. We've knocked off an order of magnitude. Yeah. Well, our time is ticking down. Yeah, there were some other How's things we could have talked segment? about. We'll, we'll do it another time. Yeah, we. I'm sure we will come to those things in good time. Uh, but for now, let's have some recommendations. Well, you're um, supposed to go first. Uh, that's right. Um, <laughs> uh, in the spirit of very mundane and practical pay the bills type recommendations, mm. <laughs> I'm going to recommend the classic book, The Total Money Makeover by ah. Dave Ramsey. <laughs> um, I am generally skeptical of books that are marketed with the author's face on the cover. Yes, I agree. Also of gimmicky titles like The Total Money Makeover. <laughs> um, but it's a it's really worth a read. Um the the fascinating thing about Dave Ramsey and this book and sort of the whole the culture that surrounds yes. Dave Ramsey is that the data backs up what the Bible says. <laughs> Where wow. It's like, Amazing. You look at the book of Proverbs and it's like the borrower is servant to the lender, mm. you know, don't strike hands to be surety for your neighbor. Mm -hmm. um, and all these things where it's like, okay, this, yeah, okay, this seems like good advice. And then it's like, well, it's from the Bible. So it's also got like <laughs> authority to its advice. Yes. Um, and then he's like, yeah. And it turns out when we studied people who actually like were successful. This is how they did it. <laughs> and that just like, you know, it shouldn't surprise me, but it's, I find it reassuring every time. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, up front, I mentioned recommending the study of history. Um, I got to see my tax guy the other night. We see each other once a year. Um, but we are in some sense kindred souls, even though I'm a Christian, he's Muslim. Hmm. He greeted me with um, Darmak and Jalad Nagra <laughs> shock up when the walls fell when I asked him how he was doing. Um, if you don't know Star Trek, that will mean nothing to you. But as we went along and 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 talk, I mentioned my, that my daughter was a medieval studies history, and she he asked me, "So, do you like you, you? Are you interested in that medieval history?" And and oh yeah. So what do the continent Germany or or, or England? And he must have seen something when I face this, like like. Richard the Third and Bosworth Field. Okay, <laughs> what are the odds of picking that particular, those particular elements out of the entire English Middle Ages? So we went on and had a discussion as to whether or not Richard the Third actually killed the two princes in the tower. And he came up, he had a new theory I'd never heard before. Hmm. But in the light and spirit of that, I recommended to him a book that I will now recommend. I don't think I've mentioned it before, but maybe I have. It's called The Daughter of Time. It's a mystery story. It's written by the British authoress Josephine Tay, that was her pen name, I can never remember what her real name was. Um, but she writes a number of mystery stories in a typical cozy sort of English style, sort of like Agatha Christie, but not as um, well rigged and organized perhaps. And she has a detective named Alan Grant. And for this particular book, she throws Alan Grant into the hospital. He breaks a leg or something chasing a crook. And he's there bored to tears. And a friend brings some pictures because he likes to look at faces. He likes to try to read people's 
character out of their faces. And one of the pictures is Richard III. Now, for Americans and other people who don't know much about British history, Richard III in British tradition is the original wicked uncle who got to the throne by killing his two nephews, one the reigning prince or king, and the other the heir to the throne. And everybody knows that. That's just, that's a given like Benedict Arnold betraying, you know, West Point to the British. It's just, it's, it's the name that just sends shivers up your, your spine. Well, as Alan Grant is laying in bed, looking at the picture, he says, that's not how I read, would read that face. Before I knew who it was, I, I read something very different in that face. And so he begins to consult the histories and finds that there are things that don't make sense. This man was incredible, incredibly loyal to his brother and then killed his brother's children. This man had a reputation for restraint and mercy, and yet he murdered these two little boys just to get the throne. The man had never seemed interested in power or anything, and yet he wanted the throne so badly. This is not working. Hmm. And so he begins to go do the thing that historians are supposed to do, look at original sources. And the more he does, the more the whole story begins to fall apart. This is not what these sources say happened. You can't make that story fit with this. Something's going on here. And as um, as a bit of studying history, it's great for showing you how little you can trust historians. <laughs> um, one of the most famous lines, if they're famous, is 40 million textbooks couldn't possibly be wrong, could they? <laughs> um, but if you just like mystery stories and you're willing to struggle with a little bit of history you may not be familiar with, it's a really great um, mystery story. It's it's all the clues and the analysis and the sidekick and you know everything you're expecting. So if you want to easily slip into reading, learning about British British history to keep up, because Richard the Third gives way to Henry the Seventh, Henry Tudor. Mm. And that begins the Tudor lines of king that leads to Henry the Eighth, we all know, and Elizabeth and Bloody Mary and Edward and all of that. And Lady so this Jane is Grey. The, and Lady Jane Grey. This is the doorway to all of that. Mm -hmm. So it's worth your time if you had to have not le learned to love to read history yet. Try it, and it's probably easier to read even than Herodotus. <laughs> well, that's great. I'm going to have to get that from my library. That sounds yeah, really yeah. fun. Ha you haven't read it yet? No. I've seen I've seen it uh, alluded to in many things that you have written. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I'm going to buy a copy and give it to my tax guy because he needs it more desperately than <laughs> We'll see. If I have an extra copy, maybe I can throw you one. <laughs> All right. So time to say goodnight, Gracie. All right. Good night. Thank you so much <laughs> for this conversation, Greg. It's been a delight. Uh, thanks also to David, our producer, and my lawfully wedded husband, who has... It sounds like successfully put Gretchen down to bed. Mm. I I definitely heard some unsuccess, but now it seems like <laughs> successful. Um, thanks also to our financial supporters. We appreciate you keeping the show rolling. If you'd like to join their number, listener, you can visit our website. Oh, there she is. <laughs> you can visit our website, anchor.fm slash halting toward Zion, or you can become a patron at Patreon. Patreon, Patreon, however you say it, patreon.com slash halting towards Zion. And as always, you can get us, get a hold of us um, by sending us an email at halting towards Zion at gmail.com. Send us your favorite books, TV, lifestyle, hacks. What do, you, what do you call this? Food. Yes. Send us your recipes. We want them. We'll make a halting towards Zion cookbook or something. There you go. Yeah. And you should also write us and tell Greg how much you would enjoy a new podcast walking <laughs> toward all the Star Trek episodes <laughs> from a Christian perspective. <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us this time. Hope you will again next time. Peace. <laughs>